legislators are human beings. Our biology and our brains work like yours. And that means when someone is screaming in our face or telling us that we're evil or we don't care, our logical brains turn off, our amygdala fires up, and we just want to fight or flee, right? Mm -hmm. We try and work through that and actually listen thoughtfully to everyone. But if you get up at the microphone and yell and scream and, and tell the legislative body that they're evil, that's not the best way to get a meeting with them. You're listening to the Blueprint for California Advocates podcast. My name is Christina Boss Hamilton. I'm your host. I'm also the founder of KPH Advocacy, a lobbying and political consulting firm based in Sacramento, California. If you're an advocate in the work for justice, equity, sustainability, you're in the right spot. In each episode, I bring on special guests who share their insight and tactical advice on what it really takes for your political and legislative campaigns to succeed. If you enjoyed today's episode, please don't forget to leave a review on your podcast player and also share the episode with your network so we can spread the word and share this important information with as many advocates as we can. Now let's get into it. Today is the one year anniversary of the United States Supreme Court Dobb decision. It is a sad day for Americans, especially for women who want to have control over their body and their healthcare. I wanna start the episode by acknowledging that and also welcoming you to my fantastic conversation with Mayor Libby Schaff. Mayor Schaff served as the mayor of City of Oakland from 2015 to 2023. She is now the interim executive director for Emerge California. We speak about women stepping into the power that they already have, the power that you already have, and how hard it is sometimes to recognize that you are ready, that you are qualified that there's no more waiting. It's time to move forward. We talk about how advocates can influence lawmakers, share ideas for policy. I have linked in the show notes, the Emerge California website. I want to encourage you to share it, either sign up yourself or share it with other women that you think would be fantastic representatives of their communities. I'm thankful to the mayor for sharing time with us today and let's get going. Welcome to the Blueprint for California Advocates podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Mayor Libby Schaff. I'm so delighted that you are taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. The Blueprint for California Advocates podcast is all about bringing leaders from around the state to share their expertise on political process and policy process. And having the former mayor of the great city of Oakland joining us and the interim executive director of Emerge California is really exciting to me because you come with just so much experience. And thank you for joining. And I'd love if you took a moment to introduce yourself and where you started and where you are right now. Well, Christina, thank you so much. And I just want to recognize like you're one of the good guy lobbyists. I, I'd like to say you're like Glenda the Good Witch in <laughs> The Wizard of Oz. Like, like usually that. we think of lobbyists as kind of evil and conniving and you are out there fighting and advocating for the good guys. So thank you for what you do. My name's Libby Schaff. I am born and raised in Oakland, California. I grew up in love with my city and I came to public service and even politics just out of a love for community. I really wasn't very political. I just hella loved Oakland. I was a Girl Scout. I did go to law school just because I didn't know what else to do with my liberal arts background. <laughs> I took a soul sucking job at a big law firm because I had so much student loans to repay. But I walked away from all that to start a centralized volunteer program in the Oakland Public Schools because I knew that I had a heart that belonged in public service. And it was just a natural step to then move over to Oakland City Hall. I didn't have a particularly high opinion of politicians till I went to work in City Hall and just saw the incredible dedication, 
not just of politicians, but the people who work for the city of Oakland, the people who fix your sewer systems, the people who run your libraries and your parks and your rec centers, like they are some of the best people you could ever hope to work alongside. And to make our world a better place, starting in Oakland, like starting where home is for you, everyone should have that joy and experience living a life of purpose. There is so much work to do to improve this community. And I feel very blessed to have done it as a city council member, as the mayor of my hometown for two terms, and now as the interim executive director of Emerge California that recruits and trains kick-ass women to run and win elected office. And I'm proud to say we have more than 300 alum who have served in public office, 210 right this minute, Emerge alumni in elected office in California, 21 years, we can have a drink now, that Emerge has been <laughs> doing its great work in California. So proud to be nurturing the next generation of leaders. I love it. I'm a huge fan of Emerge and consider the podcast to be Emerge adjacent in that it's about empowering people to participate in government, to grow into their own leadership, to have an ability to influence the process. I don't think that government should be mysterious. I don't think running for office should be mysterious. And we know that for years and years and years, this information for the most part has been gatekept. And organizations like Emerge dispel and break down and give confidence and support. And I just think that's so necessary and so brilliant. So let's start with, as someone newly running for office for city council in Oakland, I'd love if you just shared from the perspective of, I am getting into this thing and I don't even know where I'm starting from. <laughs> well, it really starts with my Emerge story. I had just been laid off by the Port of Oakland during the Great Recession. I had a newborn baby still breastfeeding and, you know, a toddler, under, like two-year-old. And I heard my screen door squeak one day. And when I finally got around to looking out the door, my godmother had left Nancy Pelosi's biography with the Emerge application stuffed into it with a post-it note wow. that said, you Amazing. have to do this Amazing. from Judy. So Judy nominated me, you know, Judy was the one who said, you've got to do this political training program. And it's funny because I had been the legislative aide to the president of the Oakland City Council. I had worked for Mayor Jerry Brown. I had been the director of public affairs for the port. But running for office seemed like something maybe I might do someday, certainly not with, you know, a newborn and a two-year-old, but Judy told me to do it. She believed in me and I want more Judys out there because studies show that women need to be asked to run. They need to be told that they're ready. I don't love that fact, but it is true. And it's it's held true for more than 20 years. In fact, it's slightly worse than it was 20 years ago, as far as women underestimating their own qualifications right. for That's public right. office. That's right. So I did the Emerge program in 2009. And it was doing that program that just gave me the, you know, slap on the forehead. What am I waiting for? Yeah. I've been telling men what to do. <laughs> I've been making them look good in public office for all these right. years. Right. Clearly, I'm ready to do this. And so it was really the encouragement of Emerge being equipped with those technical tools of exactly how to run a campaign. And then just the love and support of the sisterhood. Mm. Never underestimate that power. And that is a gift from Emerge that has kept giving since 2009. In fact, you know who interviewed me to get into Emerge before she had ever run for office? Malia Cohen, who is now, you know, the first Black, first Black woman controller of the fourth largest economy in the world. That's the state of California. That friendship has continued to support me and nurture me all these years. And just my sisterhood love has grown and grown and grown. So that's why so, I decided to run for city council right after I did Emerge. What a great story. Let me just tell you, I, I was actually joking 
with another Emerge alum where I was like, I am jealous because I am not an alum. <laughs> so I'm not a member of the sisterhood, but I always am like, oh, I want to be an alum too. So you're, you're cracking me up because I'm like, I probably should just do Emerge even though I don't plan on running for office. Then we're not going to accept you because we don't want to give you a spot uh, that someone could take who's going to actually hold office. Now, you can come to our parties. You can be part of the sisterhood by supporting mm -hmm you know, emerge. Sisters. Okay. But that's me. We, that's me. our mission is to actually get women into elected positions. We love all of you who support that mission and who are kind of mission adjacent. You know, emerge has more than 850 alum right now, but Amazing. only 300 have served. So we have, you know, 500 alum, but they're doing other things that are politically yes. powerful. Yeah. They are yes. heading up nonprofits. They are advocates. In fact, some of them are good guy lobbyists like you. <laughs> so it is it is a great training. But but our mission is to get women in elected office. And you know, Christina, just to remind your listeners, you and I are talking on really the one year anniversary of the Dobbs decision. We can no longer count on our judicial system of the United States of America to protect our freedoms as women. Right. Right. That is now going to be up to legislatures. Yeah. And so to get women into these legislative bodies, to get women into policy making positions is more important than it's ever been. Yes. Um, and yes. you know, this Supreme Court is going to keep going. If yes. they can rip away a constitutional right that has been there for more than 50 years, this is not the end of it. They want to put yeah. us back, you know, pregnant in the kitchen. <laughs> That's the truth. No, you're you're totally right. When you say that or when I say that, people are like, oh, you're just exaggerating. And I'm like, no, no, I don't think there's an exaggeration going on mm -hmm. here. Lately, what I've been hearing is, you know, making divorce illegal in certain states. And I'm like, we are living in The Handmaid's Tale. I never thought, I read The Handmaid's Tale when I was in college and never in a million years that I think we would be following the script. We'll put a tab in that one because that is a very upsetting thing to be talking about. But one of the things that you said really struck me, which is stepping into the power that we already have and you coming to a moment of realizing, what am I waiting for? Like I'm, I am qualified. It's not something I really got in a deep intuitive sense until I got much older. I feel like people would tell you that, but it didn't really make sense until it makes sense. Like oh yeah, I'm just as good as anybody here. In fact, I'm probably smarter than a lot of these people. Me being embarrassed and afraid. I had like this aha moment of like, what am I afraid of? If I don't know, I don't know. I'll find out and I'll get back to you. And just that epiphany moment of the heck am I waiting for? Or why do I think I can't do this? Christina, I when I was a council member, people used to say, oh, you should be the mayor. And I totally thought they were just kind of being polite. It's mm. like when you get a bad haircut, but people mm -hmm. tell you, oh, nice haircut. And you yeah, know, yeah. it looks terrible on you, but it's the polite yeah. thing to say when they notice you've gotten a haircut. <laughs> right, so I right. felt that way all the time until I realized I am gonna run for mayor. And, and let me tell you, when I decided to run for mayor, it was against an incumbent which is something I never thought I would do. Although I, I promise you, I did not do one bit of negative campaigning. Mm -hmm. That's just not in my nature. Mm -hmm. But you have to, and Christina Harbridge, who is one of your other guests, trains on this, celebrate your discomfort. When you are feeling uncomfortable, say, yay, I'm uncomfortable. That means I'm growing. And it means that I'm in a situation that needs my perspective. If you find yourself in a room where you are the only one that looks like you, or you are the only one who has had a certain life journey or life experience, that means your specific wisdom is needed more than ever. So when that moment of discomfort comes, celebrate it. It means you are exactly where you should be. And it means your power needs to come out at that moment. Unleash it, liberate it, liberate mm -hmm. your power. I love this concept of embracing the discomfort because life is discomforting, right? Positions of leadership are uncomfortable a lot of the times. 
making policy decisions, even though I'm not a policymaker, but I sure push policymakers, that is very difficult. That is uncomfortable. And that is inherently part of being a leader. So I love just dispelling the myth that it's like, I'm superwoman and everything's going to come easy to me. And I just know the right thing to say all the time. No, actually, you don't always know the right thing to say. And you might actually step in it. But that's okay because people step in it and then they get past it, you know. And that's how we learn and that's how we grow. And sometimes right. it's the biggest risks that we take that end up being the best things we've ever done. So I'm so sad and happy that you brought up that tomorrow exactly is the one year anniversary of the Dobbs decision. It is a terrible state that we're in right now in the United States. I talk about this in other episodes and I actually have other episodes forthcoming about what I consider the growing tide of extremist, right-wing, white supremacy, fascism. Again, people automatically want to poo-poo you like you're exaggerating. And I don't think that I'm exaggerating when I say that. Most historians, especially World War II historians, will tell you very similarly that a lot of this stuff is playbook, right? This has happened before especially the extreme attacks on LGBT queer community. So the antidote. On this is a good, okay. this, the book on tyranny lessons from the 20th century by Timothy Snyder is a really good, it's a short read mm -hmm. that really shows you the incredible parallels that are going mm. on right now in our country that you yes. can see they've borrowed yes. playbooks from Hitler, Stalin. It's, very sobering. I'll link to that book in the show notes. It's easy to get so overwhelmed and stressed out and just hopeless feeling. And I'll admit, I struggle with this, right? Where I am like, we're just doomed. It's all messed up. It's just going to keep getting more messed up. And then have moments of reflection where I say movements for progress through our history they move forward, they move backward, and it doesn't mean you give up and you go home. It just means the pushing part is getting harder. And it ties in with what you were saying around women running for office in the sense that women need to be in positions of making laws that impact our bodies and our ability, you know, our freedoms, our healthcare decision making, et cetera. And so the work that you're doing is even more important right now. It really is. And please don't agonize, organize. <laughs> don't wrap yourself in a paralyzing ball of depression, but step into your leadership. And think about, for example, where gay marriage was 10 years ago and where it is today. Movements matter, they make change. And I think advocates don't recognize how much influence they have and how hungry legislators are for their ideas. When you're a legislator, when I was on the Oakland City Council, you know, it's like drinking from a fire hose of, mm. of challenges, of problems. And it's everything from systemic racism, kind of the big stuff, to, you know, that lady that calls you every day about the crack in her sidewalk or the mm. dog barking next door. I mean, it's literally all that. And so when an organized group comes and says, one, assume your legislators have good intent. Mm -hmm. Assume your legislators want to make positive change mm -hmm. and then bring them the tools. When a group walks in, I worked a lot with labor, with you know, a, an actual piece of legislation. I worked with what is now ACE when I was a council member to bring forward groundbreaking anti-predatory lending legislation. In fact, it was so good, it went all the way to the Supreme Court and they said that the city did not have the power to regulate banking. Oh, wow. But it turns out history showed <laughs> that that legislation was more than needed and it really was a crime that it got overturned. But I'm just telling you, they brought this well-researched piece of legislation and I just got to run with it and introduce it and get it passed. And legislators are always looking for those good ideas. I remember being surprised when I was a council member getting a call from then newly elected assembly member Rob Bonta and said, do you have any ideas for legislation I should run? 
And we came up with a bill together around common sense gun laws, around mm. improving registration, improving the ability to take guns away from people that should not have them. It did not get passed through the legislature or, or that or Jerry Brown vetoed it. It was one or the other. I think Jerry Brown might've vetoed it. But <laughs> My point is your legislators are looking for ideas. So mm -hmm. assume that they want to make the change that you are passionate about and then try and get a meeting with them. Bring them your idea. The more fully baked it is, the better. If mm -hmm. you're part of a coalition, that is also going to get the attention of your legislator. Legislators love when it's a, a whole group behind an idea because you're then going to help advocate to right. that legislator's colleagues right. to get it passed. Right. And, you know, if you're having trouble, most legislators and mayors and elected officials have a publicly published calendar. There's no shame in stalking them. Show up at oh, an event totally. they're going to be at. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I give the same advice. I don't use the word stalking, but I give the same advice. So what you're saying is 100% true, but I want to infuse the on the ground realness of what advocates face, which is everybody is clamoring to get the attention of that council member, that board member, that supervisor and legislator, never mind statewide officer. Sometimes, you know, the problem is just getting in front of people because you're just, you know, for all intents, Joe Schmo, right? And how do advocates get past that cacophony of other voices to be like, no, my voice is important. I'm here and you need to listen to me. And a lot of it for me is you need to be around. So they see you and you're not just someone who showed up one day, but you're the one that comes to council meetings, right? You're the one that works with that organization that has been doing all of these things and you're committed. You may not agree and they may not agree, but that person is in it for the long run. They're in it for the same reasons. We all want to accomplish the same thing. But I'd love to get your perspective as an elected, say as mayor, for advocates who are just trying to break through. We talked before this started about legislators are human beings. Our biology and our brains work like yours. And that means when someone is screaming in our face or telling us that we're evil or we don't care, our logical brains turn off, our amygdala fires up, and we just want to fight or flee, right? Mm -hmm. We try and work through that and actually listen thoughtfully to everyone. But if you get up at the microphone and yell and scream and, and tell the legislative body that they're evil, that's not the best way to get a meeting with them. Now, I you know, have often heard somebody get up, speak at the microphone, and then sent my staff to get their contact information so I can follow up with them. Hmm. People actually do pay attention to you when you speak at an open forum or you speak at an issue. Mm -hmm. The second thing is if you are bringing the legislator, not just a problem, but also a solution. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. we, we all know and care about the problems and we are desperate to find solutions. So just to say, you know, you need to do more about domestic violence or reproductive freedoms, systemic racism, you know, whatever the issue is, that is not as productive as saying, I have a policy proposal. And the second thing is, if you have a policy proposal that involves money to try and figure out what that funding source would be, mm -hmm. because everybody wants more resources, but unless you're the federal government, the federal government gets a credit card. Right, <laughs> the rest of right. us don't. <laughs> right, we have to right. balance our budgets every year. And so if I spend more money on X, I have to take it away from Y unless... And I've done this with community groups and I've loved doing it. We run a ballot measure and get the voters to vote to increase their taxes or to issue a bond. That's just growing the pie. And that's, that's my favorite kind of a funding source because mm -hmm. I believe in government. I believe in the nobility of our collective best selves. That's what democracy is. And I think that is a worthwhile investment. One of the things that you said earlier struck me, and I'll tell you why. When I was at the United Domestic Workers, before I launched my own firm, which by the way, I never had the confidence to think that I could have my own firm. And it took a couple of years of people 
saying to me, you should think about doing this for me to actually contemplate and be like, really people? Really? Yeah. You think anybody would pay me? <laughs> Good for you. You are Isn't a woman crazy? owned business. And now I run a business and I'm in, halfway through my third year. So yay. But when I was at the union, I would sit in with candidate endorsement interviews all the time. And sometimes I would say more frequently than you would imagine, I would be thinking this person is not ready to run for the assembly or the Senate. They probably should be running for city council or they should really be thinking about local office. And I would very delicately try to say, have you thought about that? Fundraising wise, it might be smarter to start at the local level and build yourself up from there. And I find that we have this view of politics that it's like, I'm going to go to Congress, right? Like I'm getting involved and I'm running for Congress. Listen, I'm not saying people shouldn't do that at all, but there's also stepping stones. And there's the reality that at the local government level, there is so much you have control over that you can influence, I would say more than any other level of government. And again, not to damper anybody's ambitions, but I think that emphasizing running for a local position, even a commission, even trying to get an appointment to a local commission, that's all so important. Absolutely. God, there are two things you said that I really want to underscore. One, this is a unique value add of Emerge. A lot of political programs only train women that are running for state or federal office. Emerge will train you because you want to run for, I think the library commission was Nancy Pelosi's first elected office. Nice. Um, school board, we train lots of school board candidates. You know, whatever that first office is, because we're not going to have a pipeline of women senators and Congress members without right. getting women into that first office. And you are absolutely correct, Christina. Usually Congress is not your first elective office. Right. <laughs> but the second thing is, I want to make a pitch for local government. I love working in local government because you fly at the perfect altitude, Christina. You are high enough that what you are doing can change the world. As a mayor of Oakland, I was on two international delegations to COP27 and to Habitat 3, like literally influencing international sustainability policy. And I was doing things in Oakland that became national models that were being replicated. Last year, we won an award from HUD for having one of the best homelessness prevention programs called Keep Oakland Housed. We're constantly being replicated. Our Oakland Promise program is constantly being cited. We have people coming from all over the country looking at the cradle to career continuum we created and how we close the digital divide during COVID. So you can influence the world by doing things right at the local level. And people mm -hmm. see cities as the centers of innovation. Mm -hmm. And you are flying low enough that it is intensely personal. Mm -hmm. The problems you are solving are not theoretical. You have held that mother in your arms who lost their child to gun violence. So when you bring forward violence prevention legislation, it is extremely personal. You know the people whose lives you are impacting. You have met those children that graduated from college because of the Oakland Promise. It is so profoundly touching to know and be in intimate relationship with the people you serve. And I don't think you get that as much at those higher levels of government. So please consider local government. You fly at that perfect altitude where it is both intimate and hugely impactful. 100%. The other thing that I will say about local government and especially about being a mayor you know, our congressional seat just opened up because Barbara Lee is running for U.S. Senate. Yay, I'm a huge supporter of hers. And, you know, people are like, well, Libby, you should run for that seat. But I'm like, I don't want to be in Congress. There is so much partisan gridlock there. And oh, I always totally. say, like, mayors don't have time for partisan gridlock. We all belong to one party. It's the party of get shit done. 
And mm -hmm. it actually is, again, very satisfying at the local level because you get things done, real tangible things. Whereas it just feels sometimes like in, in Congress, people are kind of giving speeches one way or another. Now, right now, we actually are getting some things done at the national level because we've got you know so much democratic control. But I, I will just say, it's, if you're an impatient person, <laughs> that gets frustrated easily. Oh, yeah. The local what level do you need? 10, is very 10 years before you even get a, put on a committee or something, right? The seniority yeah. rules are, are like really yeah. crazy, too. Yeah. 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 yeah that is 100%. For sure. 100%. Thank you for, for emphasizing the importance of local government. Actually, I talk about that a lot, too, because I think, again, we have this sort of like Hollywood version of running for office. You know, we're going to be the next AOC and it's like, you know, she's, I would say more the outlier than the, the norm and God bless her. She's got like the charisma that made it all happen. And she clearly worked very hard, but the hard work at local government level is just as important, if not more so. Well, in local government is where the proof cases are made. I'm also a fellow this year with mayors for a guaranteed income. I'm mm. super passionate about the guaranteed income movement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the whole national strategy was like, let's demonstrate how effective this policy is city by city by city. And mm -hmm. then we're going to bring all that data and evidence to Congress to try and get a federal policy passed. But it yes. all started at the local level. Yes. So I want to be respectful of your time. And I always end my interviews by asking, what is one actionable piece of advice that today somebody can do? They finish listening to this, they put their phone down and what should they be doing right now? Well, it sounds a little self-serving, but go to emergeca.org. If you are a woman, consider applying to be in our next training class. And if you are a woman, but you're not ready to run yet, or if you're a man, and again, Emerge welcomes anyone who identifies as a woman or non-binary folks that feel comfortable in a woman-centric environment. We have had many, many trans trainees that are part of our sisterhood. Very proud of that. But nominate someone. Think of someone that you believe will help advance that issue, that thing you're passionate about, that person who maybe doesn't see themselves as a leader that you see as a leader, nominate them. Do what Judy did for me. Leave that application on their digital front doorstep. You can put in somebody else's contact information and Emerge will reach out to them and say, hey, somebody thinks you should be in elective office, if they do, we do apply for our program. Love it. I love that. I will put the web address in the show notes for sure. And I cannot thank you enough, Mayor Schaff, for sharing your pearls of wisdom and leaning on your experience to, to push the ball forward. Lift while you climb. Lift while you climb. I love that so much. Thank you Lift so others. much while, uh, for taking your time. I know you're a busy woman and Hopefully I'll see you next week in Sacramento. Awesome. And Can't wait. Thank you again.